Okay, so we were just talking about, um, you know, uh, guiding reporters and making sure that we, these values are showing up in their work and in how they're reporting. Just kind of to summarize, you know, editors can help writers be ethical and be effective reporters in a way that fits our, you know, community based journalism and is accurate um, and clear and, um, you know, pays attention to the, um, yeah, to what, what will uh, make our stories be able to our, our readers. So, um, to once the reporting is over, well, once the reporting is paused, really, and you have enough that you think you have a draft or that you think you're ready to write a draft, um, you know, your reporter will, will turn in a draft to you. And then you have to think about the, starting to think about the writing level of editing, um, which is, I think, often like the main thing that we think about when we talk about editing. Um, but uh, so glad to get into that a little bit, even though those other pieces are very important. Um, so when I think about editing writing, I think about um, making sure that a story or a piece of writing is clear on every level um, and making sure that it's accurate and that it's creative. And in a big picture edit, before we're getting to some of the, you know, copy editing level changes that we might wanna make, we wanna answer the biggest questions about the story and the story's framing. Um, so, you know, the big picture question is, does this piece achieve its objectives? Does it add something new to what we know about this topic? Does it get at the most important aspects of it? Is it interesting? Is it well reported and ethically sound? Um, does it entice the reader to read it? Um, those are like big questions that you're thinking about and yeah. need to say, okay, well, if we're not, you know, you're looking for that when you're doing, when you first start to look at a draft and if you're seeing places where we're not achieving those things, you know, those are the kinds of notes you wanna start compiling to give to your writer. Um, on a more, you know, kind of breaking that down more of like other structural things you might be looking for in a story. Does it have a good lead? Does the lead draw the reader in? And, um, you know, does, it, does the reader learn enough about what the story is about early on um, to, to follow it and be interested? Um, and then does the ending work, you know, is it, is it trite or like sort of vague and even handed? Like those are things that you, those are major pieces of the story that you might want to start messing with, sorry. Um, does the overall story kind of in between that beginning and ending have a ineffective structure? Um, if the piece has multiple threads, you might be looking for, you know, should those threads be woven together? Do they stand more clearly as separate sections? Um, in what order do I need to introduce, does the writer need to introduce information to tell the story in a clear and compelling way? So, you know, you might read through a story and see, oh, like this, um, uh, this piece of information would really make everything that is in the second to last paragraph would really make these five paragraphs above it way clearer if I introduce that earlier and then the reader would be able to follow that. Um, that's something that you can be looking for. Um, could a reader with the background information of your target audience follow the logic of the piece? Those are all things that can, or kind of ways of getting at, you know, does this structure work for the reader? Um, I think about, you know, whether the piece has the right tone, like how does the way it's written determine who it's for? Um, a tone might be different for a person, will be different for a personal essay versus a more, um, you know, reporting heavy piece. Um, is, it, is it fitting what this, piece, this story needs? And then this kind of really big picture question that we were talking about before of like, is there enough reporting? That's always sort of fundamentally coming back to that. Are our claims sufficiently backed up? Does the story stand up to scrutiny, not just if someone pokes on one of the claims, um, but also, you know, in terms of like, well, yes, someone said this is true, but also does the story stand up to scrutiny in the sense of would someone from the community the story is about say, yes, I think, you know, I think this story has enough. I, I, I trust the people that this person has talked to. I think that this is honest enough about the complexities of what's going on here. Um, do you have enough? Or thoughtful enough reporting to support all of that. Um, 
is there anything missing? Is there like a piece of information that would really, you know, add to the piece or make it more clear? Um, who are the sources? Are they the right sources for what the story you're trying to tell? Um, these are all things you want to look for when you think about, you know, the the top level of what's going on in a draft or the stuff that might need the most work before you get to, you know, the level of polishing it. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is um, practice editing a draft using some of those um, ideas that I was just talking through about what you're looking for in terms of the values of the story and what you might be looking for in terms of, um, you know, is the structure working? Is the ending working? Is information organized in a clear way? Um, does everyone, and then we'll take a break after that. <laughs> because uh, I know we've been going for a while. Um, does anyone have any questions before we get to that? And then I can kind of talk through um, what we're about to do. Cool, okay. Um, well, I am gonna drop a link to a Google Doc in the chat and um, if you could make a copy of the document, that would be great. If you want to make edits or you can kind of write down notes separately of what edits you would make. Um, but I would love for you to look at this condensed first draft, read through it and make some, start to think about what edits you should make. It doesn't have to be totally comprehensive and don't bother with making any, you know, sort of messing with the syntax of individual sentences that are maybe a little awkward. I want you to focus on, you know, it does the structure work well? Is there anything missing that you would want filled in? Um, you know, it, if, you're, if you're looking at something on a sentence level, you should be able to say like why you think that's sort of a, a bigger picture question that that involves. Um, does that sound good? Yeah, I have a question real quick. So are yeah. we making like, are we going into suggestion mode on the Google Doc or you want us to make them separately and then like verbally discuss our ideas? Yeah, so what I want you to do is you can make a copy of the Google Doc and um, make suggest edits and suggesting mode there. Or you could just, that's, to, that's something you could do or you could write down like a couple of comments of like, oh, I think this, you know, I think this paragraph should be moved. I think that this, you know, you should add reporting about this. Does that make sense? So it's kind of up to you. I, I think we'll come back and talk about it for a few minutes afterwards. So I'm, you know, I'm not going to like pour over your edits, but whatever's most helpful to you. Cool. Um, yeah, Jackie or Martha or Jim, who I think just came back, if any of you have, you know, kind of an example of a story where you thought it needed to be restructured or where you saw a new reporting at the draft stage, you know, if you want to talk about that for a minute, that might be helpful for people to think through. Um, but I'm putting you on the spot, so no pressure. And I'm going to drop this in the chat so people can start making, um, making copies if they want to or pulling it up. So I, I don't, uh, I don't have a specific story um, to, to discuss, but I think one thing that I encounter a lot of the time in my own writing and also when I'm editing other people. I think a lot of the time what often needs restructuring is the lead and the nut graph, um, which are often the hardest to write. And I think a lot of the time, um, you know, it's a, it's a balance between um, trying, so like, I never want to just like completely retop a story in my own words, right? But sometimes the lead is, is not a good lead and <laughs> just needs to be reworked. And in that case, it's usually, you know, um, it depends on the writer, like whether I, I tell them like, we need to rework this lead or um, sort of step in and do the restructuring. Often uh, I find that you can like pull elements into the lead from elsewhere in the story, but that takes like reading through the whole story. I think a lot of new writers, um, especially because we're all taught to write a certain way for school papers and that bleeds into how we write. We, we always want to do like the kind of introduction 
that is different from a lead that like works for an essay or a term paper, but doesn't work for a lead. And a lot of um, leads that need to be restructured come in like that. Um, so I think later we'll have workshops on like what leads and nut graphs all, all look like, but that's the main thing I usually have to pay attention to when I'm like doing significant restructuring of a story. Um, and then the other thing is just sort of paying attention to how the overall story flows, because sometimes there's some information that they've introduced later on that would actually work better higher in the story or something's up top that needs to be moved down because it's not in the right spot. But that, that's usually a lot easier. You just cut and paste paragraphs. That's kind of all I have off the top of my head. Yeah, that's super helpful. Um, I, I love to hear about how you think about that. So I think, um, you know, I because I, we're running a little bit short on time, I think I'll give everybody 15 minutes to work on this. And so I know that means you might skim the story and not, not necessarily have time to go through it in a ton of detail. This does not have to be comprehensive, just um, starting to see what's going on. Um, I was thinking that we would um, split into breakout, a few different breakout rooms, just so that like, if people wanted to ask questions, they each had a, a um, an editor to talk to. Does that sound good to, to folks? Cool, let me just set that up. Thanks everyone for uh, trying that out with me. I'm curious to, I'm excited to hear what people's thoughts on the, the draft or once we get the last breakout room back. Does that feel like an okay amount of time to um, take a look at that story? I think so, on my end. Yeah. You know, not a full detailed edit, but yeah. just, yeah, looking forward to the ideas. Is that everybody? Cool. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, thanks for taking the time to work through that story. I would love to hear um, some ideas people had about how they, what kinds of edits they might suggest to this story. Um, and um, particularly if you, uh, if you didn't speak up in the last, the last uh, exercise we did, I'd love to hear a little bit about what your suggestions were. I volunteer. Thank you. I also want to say I know like we might have different suggestions. There are probably multiple different ways you could edit the story that would be great. So no pressure if people disagree. But yeah, go for it, Malik. Okay, so me and Jim uh, ended up doing like a really deep dive on essentially like the lead in the nut graph. Um, first, first thing, like first, first sentence, first couple sentences actually like had me thinking that the entire piece was going to be like a feature slash like profile on the night ministry as an organization. Um, and then it sort of like immediately pivoted to talking about street medicine. Um, but then like there was just it was like a battle between like talking about like street medicine you Chicago and the night ministry. Um, and so uh, we actually like ended up looking at the published um, the 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 published story as well. But before we got to that point, we were focusing just like on the lead and the nut graph and how um, and how that could be either tightened or restructured or um, Jim's suggestion was like how a particular sentence, and I think it's a third sentence within the lead can be like strengthened um, just to bring out the fact that like we're, like we're, yes, like the night ministry is helping you Chicago develop like their street medicine team, but this piece like broadly is, is not going to be about the night ministry. It's going to be about that partnership and then like most specifically about the Chicago street medicine team. Um, so, so yeah. And then when we went to the published article, if anybody wants me to like link that or something like that, the changes to the lead, I thought were really good. Um, but let me know if I should like throw that in there or not. Yeah, feel free. Um, and you know, I'll say like, even going back through this to, to like make a short, 
short version of the first draft for you all to look at. Um, you know, I'm seeing things that we could have maybe done differently with the final version even. So no, not too much pressure on that, but um, yeah, thanks for finding that. Um, and totally, yeah, great points about, um, you know, the lead kind of being all over the place. Does somebody want to define the term nutcraft just for a second, just to make sure we're all on the same page? Um, you, Malik or Jim or anybody else? I've never been good at this assignment. Um, but, but the nut graph is the the nut graph is the is the paragraph usually high up in the story. Ideally, the maybe if you have got your nice lead and it's your second or third paragraph that basically explains why we're reading this and what questions it's going to answer. That was a great definition. Next, next question. Thank you. Anyone else want to point out something else they would have changed about or would suggest as a change to this story? Yeah, if I could. Um, I also agree with what Malik and Jim discussed that um, as Martha defines the nut graph, um, I was like, I thought I was sure of why I was reading it, but then that like switched as the story progressed. I think the main thing that I noticed was that since the story um, focused on that relationship between between unhoused folks and their importance or the importance of street medicine, I feel like it would have been important to also have houseless folks weigh in on like, so there's like a point in the story where they talk about how folks don't want their stuff being unattended while they're spending hours in the emergency room. I feel like it would be more powerful to actually have that, you know what I mean, come from someone who's actually experiencing that instead of like a, uh, like a general um, kind of like summary about the way that they feel because there are direct quotes from um, other people within the story, but there aren't direct quotes from houseless folks. And um, I'm looking from this perspective because you just talked about like punching up versus punching down. And I feel like to punch up would be to also highlight the voices of people who are actually being directly affected by this solution or this problem, um, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. And yeah, so good to point out that this whole story is theoretically about, you know, what houseless people need and isn't talking to them. And I think that that's actually, um, just to like name this, I think that's a weakness in the final story, because it, uh, I had asked the reporter to do a little bit more reporting, and then COVID hit. And, you know, there was um, not a lot of ability, right at the beginning, it felt very like, not okay for people to, you know, be going along on like medical visits and things like that and meeting more people. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this, even within the, the organizations that we do interview people, we only hear kind of a couple of voices. So that's a really, really good point. Um, I see a hand from Jim. Yeah, that also reminds me that um, when so Malik and I were looking at the final version, and I scrolled down to the end just to compare the the kicker quotes to see what it was. And I noticed the fact that the original draft of the article was sort of broadly written and could, could be an evergreen piece that's like the history of street medicine. You can publish at any time, but it was published during the pandemic. And so the final um, version of it pulled that current event into the story to talk about how the pandemic was affecting street medicine. And we just talked about how that's always um, a really useful, uh, thing to keep in mind, especially for weekly stories, because a lot of our stories are these kinds of deep dives or broad overviews. Um, but, you know, the, the world is happening uh, and it's always good to look at and see if there is a news peg um, or else a current event that can be woven into a story like they did with this one in the final, final result. Were you also, raising your hand, Francisco? Go ahead. Yeah, I just also wanted to add to uh, a good point that Jason made is that, uh, you know, you don't assume people know uh, what you're talking about. And just like um, on the part of the workers, for example, I had to look up what a peer advocate wor was, what outreach workers do. Um, so, yeah, it's just not assuming that, that people are, are going to automatically have intimate knowledge of what you know, like recovery advocates and recovery, like medical professionals do. Um, 
and I think like I think it works with that with helping um uh, you know people without homes um because you know these people exist and so I think it, it's good to educate the people on on the work that they're actually doing as well yeah I think that's a great example of a place in the story where um there's a lot of like really dense um terminology that sentence has the names of like five different kinds of workers and maybe some place ever that could have been stretched out more um or like to, to fit time to give give time to some of those definitions or maybe distribute that information differently um i'm loving everything you all are thinking about we have a few more things that we want to get to um so i i would love to move on but also if there's anything from this that you want to like discuss further later i'm always up for it um just send me a message on slack but love all of the um yeah all of the things you all were looking for in that story that's awesome so i was planning to take a five minute break here i wanted to ask how people are doing i know we had a couple of sort of accidental breaks um how are you all <laughs> do you feel like that's that would be helpful or oh yeah go ahead chima um, just real quick, I had a question. Um, I'm wondering, do we do, um, cause you were talking about like the portion that had a lot of like jargon in it. I'm wondering, do we do a uh, like vocab word when it feels like there's not space to fully flesh out like the definition of something without kind of taking away from that like paragraph or that like section. Um, do we do like, you could see the bottom of the um, article for like, you know, definitions of these words. Is that something that we do? That's interesting. I don't think that's ever something we've done. I think um, I feel like maybe it could be cool in a story that had a lot of stories, a lot of words like that. Maybe we could do a sidebar in the print edition where you know you have a little like um, section that bumps out with some more details about something. Usually, I would say, you know, in the in the way something is first written, there might not be space to define it, but then that might be a reason to. I'll, I'll usually ask someone to rewrite it so that you change the structure of the sentences or break things up more so they do have time to define it, if that makes sense. Because I feel like that is often what happens is like you, the way you first think just to put it on the page, you have a hard time getting that in. Um, and yeah, sometimes you, you end up kind of pushing people to, to rethink that. Yeah, that makes sense, thank you. Yeah, totally. Um, can I just get, oh, go ahead, Mark. I was just gonna say like, it, this was something that I actually had in my notes for copy editing, but just in general, we wanna like avoid jargon as much as possible and, and kind of like insider lingo, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Jim, I see you trying to say something else. So I'm not trying to cut you off, go ahead. I was just going to say that sometimes jargon can be useful. Sometimes jargon is the only choice in which case we, we would then define it um, in, in text too, but agreed generally. Cool. Can I get a quick thumbs up if you are feeling like we can make it another 15 minutes? Um, you, I'm sorry for not giving you a better break. Um, but if you're feeling like, no, we can take a couple minutes. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your attention. Um, we just have a few more things to talk about. Um, where is my slides? Okay. Yeah, very sorry to slip the slide. Um, so we've been talking a lot about what you're looking for in editing. And I also wanted to spend some time thinking about how do you actually achieve that? How do you actually talk with a writer and, um, you know, kind of achieve these goals, give these suggestions, put this into practice. Um, and I really think about it a lot as like looking at editing as a um, collaborative practice. And I would love if you would put a few things in the chat about you know, if you've ever worked with a great editor ever, any attributes or anything about the way they talk to you that you thought made them a good editor. Um, just a few quick examples, doesn't have to be the whole, you know, 
full definition of what would make someone a perfect editor, but I'm curious what you all think about. Nurturing, that's awesome. Ask questions instead of telling me things. Yeah, totally. Yeah, so, I mean, I think both of those answers kind of get at understanding they can be different skill levels. Yeah, I think all of those answers kind of go towards what the point I wanted to make is that I think the best editors treat it as a partnership where you're working together. Yes, Malik, you're like, they're giving you the tools that you need. They're um, curious about like what, what you're interested in or what ideas you have and, um, you know, helping helping you grow in the way that Francisco was saying nurturing, but, um, you know, not necessarily just pushing it along as just their idea. Um, I think that it, um, you know, if you think of your job as supporting the reporter to do their best work, and while also like keeping an eye out for the larger publication, that that is like a good sort of summary of that. And, you know, it's really important for the weekly in particular, because we work with both really experienced writers who the thing that they get out of working for the weekly is being able to work on stories that they're not able to publish elsewhere with really thoughtful editing um, or writers who are really inexperienced who, you know, the thing they get out of it is us helping them build their skills. Um, so in either case, like you treating that as a partnership can be really helpful and like respect the writer's knowledge, help them apply their talents and make everything better basically. <laughs> um, so one particular thing I wanted to note about that is like, as I know a lot of people on this call have experienced firsthand, um, journalists of color and from other marginalized communities are less likely to be treated with the respect of a collaborator that they should get from an editor. It doesn't happen all the time. And like, you know, you're in the editor seat now and like you have a chance to, um, you know, take extra care to like make sure that people maintain power over their work and that their ideas are respected. Um, even if their ex expertise is that they're bringing in is from something other than journalistic writing. Like it's, it's your chance to do a good job of that basically. So one way that you can do that and kind of put this kind of collaboration into practice is to respect the writer's voice. Um, I think of rewriting as a last resort and something you should use sparingly. I mean, I think it's okay to rewrite a sentence or two, but you know, you should, like Jim was saying, if you if you don't have to, if you can by any means avoid, you know, just rewriting an entire paragraph for someone. Um, do you know they you can if you're able to um you know give them a better sense of what you're looking for that will be less work for you and develop their skills more and help them do a better job um than if you just rewrite something and also when editors rewrite stories they introduce errors because they don't know every single detail that you know of the nuance that you were using as a reporter when you wrote that sentence um so you know, it's something to avoid when you can. And I think this kind of gets at uh, the question that Chima had at the top about, you know, what, or no, I think maybe Maddie asked this at the top about like, what is over editing? And I think that depends a little bit on the person, but I think the way that I think about that is trying to um, resist the impulse to impose changes that aren't strictly necessary. Like, is this edit for the reader or is it just for me and what I like? Um, and, you know, that I think can be helpful in thinking about when to leave something alone. Um, but I think, you know, you can also think about over editing as, you know, when you're just rewriting a ton of the story instead of making it more of a back and forth. Maybe there's a lot that does need to change for the reader, um, but, you know, you don't necessarily need to do all of that work yourself um, or to lay that all down as orders. And that can feel much more like over editing to a writer. If you're able to ask questions, like someone was saying, um, and you know, run things by the writer and leave room for conversation, um, frame things as suggestions like, oh, can you find a way to synthesize these things? Or I think this sentence is awkward. You know, what, what do you feel about this way of changing it? Um, that can make it feel much less like top down. Um, and, you know, I think that there are, um, 
oh yeah, I have a couple of examples of like ways that I might, I've said in stories in the past of like saying something as a little bit more of a suggestion or in a way where I have a little bit more curiosity about what they, what the writer thinks of it. Um, you know, there are times when you'll really need to be insistent about changing something, um, particularly when, you know, the writer isn't meeting the paper's values. If they're, you know, not, not respecting someone they interviewed or something, um, you know, sometimes you really need to put your foot down and say, no, this, this does need to change, but you can stay respectful. And, you know, when you're thinking about your role as working together with someone, that means that when something has to change, you still have to justify your thinking. You still have to persuade the other person um, and, you know, support them to reach what you're trying to do instead of just handing down an order, if that makes sense. Um, I also want to say, you know, if your writer isn't comfortable with the change you're suggesting, sometimes that's a reason to find a different way of addressing the issue. You're like, okay, you know, th this problem still exists, but maybe we can get at it in a different way. Um, or sometimes, you know, they might be uncomfortable with something that's clearly important, like reaching out to more directly impacted sources. That's usually a time when, you know, you still, you know, it's one of those times we need to be insistent, but it's probably time for a conversation offline. You can have a more deep conversation about it, if that makes sense. I, I want to add that um, I've over edited on a couple of occasions um, and I'm trying to like not do that anymore. But I, I remember that on both occasions, it was it was a Monday of production night. Uh, the, the writers weren't uh, being super responsive but I still felt that there was enough in the draft where uh, it could make it into the issue. Um, so I, I would start adding like a ton of suggestions to make the piece stronger, but ultimately I would wait for the writer to be okay with the changes. Uh, but I, I think um, one way to avoid that is just to be realistic about um, whether the piece needs additional reporting and that perhaps instead of trying to squeeze it into an issue or rush it through the production process, it might be better to just put it off, um, you know, to bump it to the following issue or bump it online instead of trying to force changes that perhaps not everyone agrees with. Um, so I just wanna put that out there that it might happen that you might be rushing, um, you know, the deadline is, is coming up and you really, want to fit a story into an issue, but sometimes it just doesn't, doesn't work out that way. Yeah, that's, I really appreciate that point, Jackie. And like, you know, I have also over edited at times and it's such, it's like so true that that time pressure can, can make it easier to do that. You know, you don't, you know, we are, we are, we're not a breaking news publication, but that doesn't mean that our stories have like no timeliness and that does Sometimes you can't go back and forth forever, but you know this is sort of like uh, you can like work from this ideal and then see like okay how you know how much leeway do I have? Do I need to just give this more time, or is it, you know is it just a little bit more um, you know kind of aggressive editing that will get this to the finish line? Yeah, I appreciate that a lot. Any thoughts on this before we? Um, move on a little bit. Cool. So in thinking about um, communicating feedback as suggestions when you can, um, or, you know, small, I think that that's more important with larger changes than smaller changes. You know, you don't um, necessarily need to ask if you're changing, you know, punctuation or a few words, but, um, you know, as much as possible when you're communicating feedback, whether that's like a big picture suggestion or um, any of your other uh, edits that might be a little bit more granular, it's really helpful if you're trying to achieve the changes you want without jumping right into rewriting. Um, and if you want to help the writer improve to um, kind of hit on a few key things about communicating feedback effectively. Um, so first one, um, be specific, you know, don't just say something is bad, um, explain to the writer 
what you want and why and give them a chance to achieve it. You can explain, you know, this isn't working because this part of the sentence is clunky or because you haven't explained this um, or, you know, what you have isn't bad, but I think it needs to be different in this specific way um, rather than just saying, you know, rewrite this sentence because that doesn't, that doesn't get you what you're looking for. Um, so I'm gonna actually show um, an example of an email where I was giving some feedback to a writer and I, you know, this isn't exactly what I sent to the person, but um, I'm gonna kind of use this to talk through like what some of these suggestions for communicating feedback in a way that helps the writer learn and helps you have a good and collaborative relationship can look like. Um, so um, highlighting like a couple of places, these are not the most specific comments that I've ever given, but I think, you know, highlighting some places in the email where I'm saying, you know, this is the particular part of the piece that needs work, not making really broad statements like, I think that all of this is bad, or I think the whole thing needs to change. I'm saying, you know, um, you need to relate it back to the pitch more. That's something you can work on. I want to move this particular piece to this particular spot. What do you think of that? Um, another thing that's helpful in, you know, constructively communicating feedback is noting what the writer did well, not just what needs to change. There are a couple of examples of that in this too. Um, you know, when you believe writers improve and remind them of their accomplishments, that can be really encouraging. And it's also, also helpful for knowing, you know, what you can build on to make the story better. Even when a story is really disorganized, there's pretty much always something that you can highlight and say, oh, you know, you're, I love your like really visual descriptions here. Can you give me more visuals over here? Like seeing where you can um, build on people's talents. Um, when you do give negative feedback, you know, always try to keep it kind and constructive and um, not make it sound too harsh. Um, people will be more likely to want to make your changes and also more likely to learn from them and like want to work with you in the future if you can do that. So um, one technique that's or one like thing that's helpful in doing that is um, sandwiching negative feedback between positive statements. So you're like reminding people that you still think that they, you still think that they can write, you still think that they have strengths, even though there are things that they need to work on in the story. So I've kind of tried to, I mean, I've highlighted in green some like more positive statements. And then, you know, in, in red, like uh, some things where I'm pointing out some criticism that I have that I'd like them to change. Um, I'm also, I also highlighted in yellow some points where I used um, sort of like softer or or um, less direct language in trying to not be, you know, overly harsh. So, you know, you want to like avoid words like never and always. You want to try to speak from your perspective when you can like, oh, I think this um, and be thoughtful about when you need to speak more forcefully or less forcefully. Um, and, um, oh, the one other thing I wanted to note was that, you know, if you spot a problem in a story and you don't have a solution, it's still important to say something rather than kind of letting it fester. You don't have to have a recommendation for how to fix everything when you point out um, a problem, but if you can, you know, if you can offer suggestions, sometimes that can be helpful to writers too. And the last thing I wanted to point out was um, asking questions that lead to improvement can be super helpful. Um, you want to understand what the writer is trying to do. You want to respect the knowledge they have of their reporting. Um, and, you know, if you ask them about how they want to change things, you can kind of guide them without necessarily and help them think it through themselves and um, without necessarily having to, uh, you know, come up with every solution by yourself. Um, and I recommend leaning on questions even more with writers who tend to be to tend to be really um uh tend to not like changes basically if you can ask them more questions rather than telling them so much um you know you can uh sort of lead them into thinking about what you're trying to do without making it sound as as forceful um so we are out of time for the final activity i wanted to do um but it will be in the slides if anybody wants to work on this later and message me about it um, 
but that is it. And we have a few more minutes for questions. I'd love to hear if there's anything from, you know, talking about the feedback part and like how you communicate with a writer or about what you're looking for before you, you know, that you will eventually need to communicate. Um, you know, anything that jumped out to you or any questions that you have, I would love to hear. Thanks for listening. Thank you.